camera's over here. It's on the laptop, which the screen's here. That's okay. This is your best side, right? Uh, well, I don't think it's the best side anywhere. <laughs> um, <but, laughs> my girlfriend might disagree with that, but um, I don't. Um, yeah, so I got an email from Jim back in 2016 saying, oh, we're doing a hot spot. And I did feel a bit bad, actually, because I'm a really good friend with Gus um, of P1 PLM of uh, DV Mega Fame. Still am, actually. He's a lovely guy. And um, so, I felt, so I sent him an email saying, I'm really sorry, but there's going to be an MMDVM hotspot. And he said, oh, great, competition, which is really nice. Oh, that's didn't a, that's I didn't a expect response. that. Yeah. It was, it was. Um, yeah, so I felt really bad about that because I was like, what do do with me? <laughs> um, so, uh, but seriously, I don't know the 702 on chip at all well. And I know that um, calculating the parameters, I think they've got an app for it. And it's very complex. You're basically feeding the numbers and you get all these hex codes out. And it's not an area I know. So when I did M17 on the hotspot, I sort of cloned, I think, P25 and tweaked yeah. a few numbers. And I'm not sure it's particularly optimum, at least on receive. Transmit seems okay. But it really is not my area of speciality. Um, well, getting in the ballpark is, is a big But it sort of there. receives a bit. Uh, transmit seems to be fine, which is good. Yeah, very good. Transmit's always the easy one anyway. Um, but the receive side is not uh, not good at all. But it'd be nice to get that working because it would open it up because it also means you can actually do testing with hotspot to hotspot. Whereas, of course, as you know, I've got basically just a pile of radios here. Um, yeah, understand. All on, all on dummy loads. Looking um, forward to it. It'll be a, it'll be a big step oh, forward. Oh, it'd be brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I'm, I'm really happy about that because I've been working on the client today. I've been asking, adding extended text uh, to it and also GPS coordinates. Uh, I mean, it might, might, all ch might all change, but you know, I'm, I'm putting it in just to see if it works and passes through the network and everything. And if so, we can uh, then tweak the format. But the idea is just to get something that works and see if we can just pass it because um, I've already, we were, me and um, oh, well, anybody owning an M17 client, we're already passing text messages to each other. So on the touch screen, uh, we can actually see each other's names, which is quite nice. Excellent. Uh, Sounds like um, a really good progress. Well, hey, let's go ahead and kick off the meeting, and then we'll, we'll, I'm sure that we'll pick up on these subjects just in a bit. Thank you all for coming. Very appreciated. Taking time out for meetings is a big deal. Uh, thank you. And there'll be some introductions uh, and discussion following uh, some very brief remarks. Uh, we have at least two technical questions that need to be answered. Uh, one directly affects the protocol definition. There are some differences of opinion on the end of stream. And there are multiple ways to do this. And all of the different ways have uh, different assumptions and different axioms and stipulations and reasoning behind them. And if all we do today is clearly identify what we've been talking about, um, and that if those if those different ways need to be tested in simulation and over the air, uh, then that's a big step forward and a, and a big victory. Uh, documenting all the different choices that we make along the way and showing the process of decision making is a super huge value uh, in any open source project. And the other question uh, affects the usability testing, verification, and validation for the silicon path. Um, that's the bit error rate testing, um, BER testing. So. I hope you all will help me uh, see why there would be any resistance to better visibility with respect to BER testing. Because um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this because those, those regimes and, and different standards are going to be required to go to silicon. Uh, it's going to be required for more data centric media. And it very well will be expected by commercial partners. So I'd like to talk about the bit error rate questions um, and, and so you all can help me understand where we're at. Um, and so those are the two technical questions. The, the technical work is, is not, honestly, not the most important part of meetings like this. Uh, working together successfully is. Uh, there have been some people who have spoken up about feeling unheard, unappreciated, uh, and uncomfortable with some of the way some of the technical discussions have gone. This meeting alone is not going to fix that, uh, not, gonna, not intended to fix it. Uh, but it can start the process, developing more of a, of a history of working together really well. So for the next hour or so, um, put everybody else in the best possible light, even if it feels like you're the one that has to carry the burden, um, and be generous with the benefit of the doubt if anything comes up. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off introductions. Um, my name is Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. I'm the co-founder and current CEO of Open Research Institute. We're the fiscal sponsors of M17. I have a master's in information theory. I run a rural telephone company. 
We have a large fiber optic plant and we offer both broadband and traditional voice services. I've worked for Global Star, AT&T, uh, Apiary, uh, Kyocera Wireless, uh, a couple other places. Uh, serve on technical advisory committees for Virginia Tech Space Industry Advisory Board, ARRL, and I've applied for position uh, as a TAC for the FCC. So we'll see how that goes. And that's uh, that's my background. I do a lot of volunteering in and out of um, out of technical work. Um, so so please, uh, would you please introduce yourself, uh, starting with Ed? <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't prepared to talk. Uh, I'm Ed Wilson. I did that on purpose. I do not have any technical background whatsoever. Like but, that. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Jonathan confirmed, and I have really bad handwriting. Um, I've been working with uh, M17 for the last year or so, and uh, Wojciech uh, brought me along. And again, I have no technical experiences, but I've been a ham radio operator for many, many years, and I have worked in team aspects for the last 23 years of my paid career. So I'm kind of used to teamwork and bringing people together from various backgrounds for a uh, joint cause to make sure it gets done. Um, that's Thank about you, it Ed. For my side. Ed, pick the next person to introduce themselves. Uh, well, according to my screen, it's uh, Jonathan. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Jonathan Naylor, G4KLX. I've been licensed since 1979 at the age of 14. Um, oh, so that's the thing. I've um, got a master's in information and communications engineering uh, from the University of Leicester. Um, I'm probably more well known, obviously, for a lot of work on DV modes. I started with D-Star back in 2009 and uh, started the MMDVM in 2015, which was released in 2016. So originally started with, I think, um, D-Star and DMR. I did System Fusion, P25, NXDN. Um, I've also did FM, AX25 based on Rob's code, although repurposed to a different scan, um, some frequency. Uh, and M17, which I think I did in, I think, about September last year, September, September October. Um, and as, as you know from the discussion about hotspots, which is uh, currently ongoing, um, things are moving quite rapidly in that way. Now I've got the main problems fixed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have suggested various things for the protocol, a number of which have been taken on board, I might add, things like the channel access number and also the uh, change of um, synchronization uh, vectors to be um, sort of more unique. Um, so sort of they're my main contribute. I think, oh, and also the way the LSF, I think, is uh, fragmented as well. Um, but essentially, yeah, um, I've, so I've got a lot of experience implementing other DV modes and uh, I've uh, seen a lot of uh, similarities and non-similarities between them, but it's, uh, it's very interesting anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, uh, I will choose Steve, KC1AWV. Oh, all right. Good evening, everyone. Well, uh, good evening to the people over, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Europe and uh, good afternoon to the people here in the U.S. Uh, I'm Steve, KC1AWV. Um, I'm a senior systems administrator uh, for the past 15 years. I've been doing a whole lot of IT work. Um, I was licensed uh, in 2013, I believe, or 2011. And then I upgraded to a general in 2013. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've been working with the, uh, M17 project since, uh, Wojciech came into a chat room and started talking about it. And I've been looking for, uh, uh a project to kind of extend my experience into amateur radio. Um, earlier it was just, you know, picking up a microphone and talking on the air and having fun with that. But, um, you know, actually having my hands in, uh, you know, uh, the involved with, uh, a project such like such as M17 definitely um, you know teaches me a lot, and uh, that's what I've really been looking forward to on this. Um, the M17 project really, I, I don't do a whole lot as far as the protocol, the spec, or you know implementations or anything like that. I, I just basically kind of take the uh, pieces that people have been developing and put them into uh, action to see uh, how well they work. And um, you know, uh, along those lines, I've been learning a lot. You know, as far as uh, understanding how, you know, radio works and, uh, you know, the math that's involved and, um, you know, the systems that we have to develop in order for these things to happen. So 
Um, I do a lot of the web development and a lot of the um, management of uh, you know the chat and and communications platforms. While Ed does a lot of the moderation for that, um, you know I'm the one that runs the systems behind the scenes and. Um, I'm also going to be building the lab uh, for M17 here in the United States, so at least one of them. Hopefully, there'll be many. Um, but yeah, I'm going to use that to uh, uh, further my development in amateur radio and, and developing M17. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I'm just a simple uh, systems admin <laughs> making my way through uh, amateur radio. So. This has definitely been a learning experience for me, and I enjoy working with everybody that's here. Uh, and I'll go ahead and pass it over to Rob, because he's the one that's up next to my list. Hi, guys. Rob Riggs, uh, WX90. Um, I am a, I've been a licensed amateur for about uh, 10 years almost. Um, I'm a software engineer. Uh, I currently work in the fintech industry. Um, and about eight years ago, I founded Mobile Link to sell these uh, TNCs that I developed for APRS. Um, and uh, that was just supposed to be a side hobby project. And it's uh, basically taken on a life of its own um, to the point where I'm having to make a decision whether or not to just dedicate full time to, uh, to, to that project. Um, but beyond that, I've been doing, um, I've been a software engineer for uh, 30 plus years now. Um, I've been involved in a lot of open source development um, and uh, started working on, um, well, I've been very interested in electronics and digital signal processing uh, for a while and recently picked up um, M17 when I saw a post by uh, Wojciech on, uh, on Reddit. Um, and piqued my interest and realized that with an open protocol, I could actually um, do the implementation uh, in the TNC um, and take it on from there. So um, I think the first implementation I had was actually done in Python on a notebook around November timeframe, um, and then quickly converted everything over to C++, uh, where we have a standalone um, Linux client that can work with RTL SDRs, um, as well as embedding that into the, the, the TNC3 uh, and some additional hardware platforms that I've been playing around with. Um, yeah, so that's my background. Um, I Is there anyone else? Oh, well, <laughs> Mike and Wojciech. Wojciech, you're up next. Okay, thanks, Rob. And hi, guys. Uh, so I'm Wojciech SP5WWP and I've been licensed since 2016, so not, not a long time. And I've started M17 back in, uh, I think, 2019, uh, at the end of the year, I think, somewhere around, around that. And uh, I have no higher education and I'm an autodidact. Uh, so uh, I've got the first uh, implementation of M17 in a handheld. And it was back in uh, 2020, I think. Uh, it was winter, I think. <laughs> I was running around uh, the city and transmitting. <laughs> uh, so it worked. Uh, but the 4FSK uh, decoder was, um, it wasn't coded by me. It was uh, just a part of the SI, uh, the Silicon Labs chip. So I just got the, the not the baseband out, but rather the bitstream out. So I just had to um, unframe it and pass it to the vocoder and do the other stuff. So there was no uh, no trellis, no Viterbi, no convolutional encoding and deco decoding, nothing like, like that, uh, but it worked. So it was my first implementation. Uh, so that, that's it, I think, from me. Is there anyone else on the call? I can't see all of the members. Oh, yeah, I think you're, you're next, Mike. Ah. All right, so my name is Mike. Uh, my call is W2FBI. I was first licensed in 2009. And uh, just as a small point of uh, interest, that call is actually from my great grandfather out on Long Island in the 30s. So it, that it's W2FBI, but it was FBI before 
the FBI had become the FBI. They were still the Bureau of Investigation. And then when the FCC went to the new call system and took over from the previous organization, uh, that's the call he ended up with. Uh, I am a software developer. I kind of got started with MD3D tools when Travis Goodspeed had first posted that one, one byte uh, promiscuous mode hack where you could suddenly decode all DMR traffic on this handheld. So that's probably where I feel most comfortable is uh, playing around with open source software in ham radio. I'm sure that's true of all of us. And uh, that particular platform, I have a lot of time doing not code on the radio itself, but support software, code plug programming, firmware upgrading, everything like that. That's part of where, where DMR.tools came out of, is it's an online project about doing support software for those radios and similar ones like it, eventually. And uh, I've written code for a lot of different things. I kind of jump from project to project doing little things that interest me. I don't have a lot of background in terms of credentials, but uh, I enjoy I enjoy playing around. And that, that has gotten me pretty far so far. And I think that concludes the introductions. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Back to my control. Very good. Uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm here only only to serve. Uh, what I'd like to do is to cede the floor for discussion uh, about any technical issues that are that are pressing. So the two that have been raised most recently in the agenda is uh, industry and and BER. Who would like to start? I'll start on the um, industry. Um, okay, I don't have thank you. I don't have I don't have much to say on BR anyway. But uh, um, yeah, my my thinking is is that current, as currently defined, the industry is a simple bit within the FN, uh, the top bit, uh, which you know with low BERs is actually fine. However, um, if you do have a problem with the BER. And we have seen it occasionally, certainly on my system. I think there's actually maybe a bug actually in the modem. But even so, it's, it's an interesting and useful test. Sometimes, and this is a, probably to do with the way uh, convolution codes work, is that if the convolution code is having a bad time, it'll often set a lot of bits correct. Oh, sorry, a lot of bits high. And through that, I often saw uh, the end of stream marker being set and causing the course the system to drop out and then come back in very very quickly afterwards because the rf was still there thinking about this i thought this is not the strongest way of doing things um, but while we had the checksum on the payload then it was less of an issue however our, the checksum was taken off which i'm fully in agreement with them i might add absolutely fully in agreement but obviously with the checksum off it means of course that we can't absolutely guarantee things there's always an element of um, what's the word and things could be wrong uh, there might be a bit you know one or two bit errors uh saying but getting rid of the checks i think was a fine and worthy thing to do i've got no issues with that whatsoever and and so looking at this and because it was dropping out from time to time it's not every over not not it's not that bad not by any means but you know it was there was a certain amount of ambiguity there and so I thought one of the best ways to do this, and in fact, the way that's done by, let me give you a list, DMR, NXDN, DPMR, um, what have DMR, oh, I mentioned DMR, um, a POYR with the ones as well. They, what they do is that they transmit essentially the header format as their end of message with a different type in, by the way. Uh, the idea is that the different type is set so that if anybody happens to decode that message on its own without seeing it in context when it's decoded they can see it's an end of message so they don't start saying oh we've, this is the beginning of a message because it's the same format so the actual type is there for random listeners as much as anything else as the receiving station receiving the stream of data all you need to do sorry i thought i heard something um that was an echo Okay. Um, with, um, with M17, we're actually in a very nice position, like DMR, that the synchronization um, symbols are different between the header and the stream data, which I think is a very, very good thing. And this means that once you're receiving a stream, your receiver can correlate 
and I do say correlate on purpose here because correlation is actually a very powerful tool. It is possible to correlate that sink. And if the sink is the same sink as a header and it follows in the stream at the right time, more to the point, after the audio, then it's actually a very easy decision then to make to say that is the end. Now, if you do correlation, my experience is that correlation is capable of correctly decoding symbols at a level below which audio is actually broken in almost every format I've worked with. So it is very powerful and can even when things are with a very high BER, that correlation will still indicate the end of a transmission. So you can, at least you can stop and move on to the next person or whatever. So that, <clears throat> so that is why I am very much in favor of having an explicit end of um, end of transmission marker based on a repetition of the header, but with a different type in it. As a receiving station, you don't actually need to decode that header. That's actually fairly unimportant. What is important is the synchronization um, a vector. I'm, I don't think I've expressed myself particularly well, but um, that is my thinking behind it. Oh, by the way, as you probably know from the discussion, um, both Tony VK3JD and also uh, Pedro M0I, I have been running this version, and you may have seen their comments along the lines of, yeah, this is really good. It works well. Okay, thank you. Is it, and you, I know you just said that you you didn't express it very well. I think I understood what you were talking about. There, there are a number of other protocols that also use this explicit um, you know, start end of, of stream. And especially for voice communications or asynchronous communications, this is this is widely used. Um, there are other framed communications uh, protocols that don't. What they do is they have all the information about the rest of the, the payload in the header only. Um, but those are ones that are uh, deterministic in length. Um, and so the thing that occurs to me is that we're assuming that M17 is uh, you know, the, the streams are going to be uh, asynchronous. They're going to be of various lengths and that this sort of thing uh, really has to, to kind of get some attention. Would that, would that be fair to say? Okay. So I had the microphone off. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, because obviously a stream of audio is, is non-deterministic. Yes, you don't know how long you're going to be speaking. And so, yes, we, we do, it, it's, it is asynchronous and we do need, whatever way we do it, we do need an explicit end for when it happens. Okay. Yeah. And ripping everything up and having every frame have its own, you know, physical layer header or something like that would probably, that'd be, that'd be much more work that would, to shifting yeah, to that yeah. would be, okay. I, I, I mean, think the, pro the protocol as it stands is, is for the most part, I mean, I, I, I could argue about one or two other things, but I really can't be bothered to be perfectly honest. Um, the protocol as it stands is pretty good. And to my mind, that is a weak point. And for example, if you want to actually move it into the commercial world, which is not of my, not of my interest because it raises interesting problems with uh, some of the, the stuff I've worked with, uh, including commercially at work. Um, if it goes into the commercial world, it really just has to be at least as good as other protocols. And I would suggest the end of uh, stream market is is one area where it definitely is not as good. Okay. All right. Uh, comments, uh, discussion from from the floor. Who would like to to talk about this next? Uh, I, I certainly can, since I. Uh, was one of the ones that raised an objection. Oh, um, and, two, and, yeah, and, and pardon me, uh, the uh, Blue Angels are flying around overhead, so it may get really loud and <laughs> uh, affect uh, what you hear. Um, so I think that there might be a, I, I understand now where Jonathan and I are differing. And that is, uh, I'm coming from it uh, from the standpoint of the uh, LSF sync word may not mean end of frame or end of stream uh, in the same sense, because one of the protocols I've been looking at is actually switching immediately after voice into a, uh, some a data mode, like a packet mode to send mm -hmm. packet data immediately afterwards. Um, and also we have talked about using uh, an LS, an inline uh, link setup frame uh, as a way of switching modes between 32-bit uh, voice and mixed voice data. Uh, so my thought was you really could not look at a, uh, th that sync word 
and just say, oh, I can drop this. My implementation has to look at the next sync word to figure out, you know, once it sees a link status frame, it expects to see a, another stream sync. It expects to be able to decode that first of all, because it's got to know what to expect next. And I think that's where, um, you know, our assumptions about what we can do with this protocol differ. Uh, so I think this, is, this has been really helpful to have this conversation because now we can kind of talk about that and whether or not, uh, which of our assumptions really uh, are, are the, make sense and, and are correct. Or if we do, I mean, I think it's, it's obvious that we have a, uh, a, a, we kind of disagree on what would happen with, in that case. So we have to decide whether or not it is feasible or, or reasonable to expect data to immediately follow us a, a stream in, in that manner. Okay, so I, that's yeah. a. That's... Sorry, I've got to oh. mute myself. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, um, I must admit, packet mode in itself doesn't actually um, interest me. I've actually just taken it out of my um, hotspot implementation. You may have seen me mention that because, um, as far as my work is concerned, I don't see how how that sort of fits in. Um, I'd be interested in that conversation about switching between modes, but I really do think it is actually a very mature minority thing uh don't forget just because you see the end um we call it the end sync sorry the header sync type appearing at the end don't forget you can actually look at the type hopefully it'll decode you can you know when the fec check do the checksum and in that case you could actually explicitly check the type to go oh is this an end marker or does this mean something else is going to happen now as as a pure digital voice implementation, I would probably look at it and go, unless it's more digital voice, then I'm not going to be interested anyway. So I'll just drop it and do an end of stream marker. But um, so there is a type associated with it. Obviously, if you can't, if the FEC is too badly corrupted and we can't get data, then we, we then have to make a decision. And my decision would be probably since, I, since I've seen the header, I'd probably drop it and in theory, it'll come back in again anyway. Um, in due course, we know matter of a few hundred milliseconds later. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not sure what else can say about that, to be honest. Okay, thank you. I can add something. I Please. Think. Okay, so if uh, Jonathan wants to use an LSF uh, frame uh, to indicate the end of the stream, uh, keep in mind that uh, the LSF is more heavily punctured uh, convolutional code than the voice uh, packets. Right, Rob? That's correct, I think. And uh, you want to use one bit of the type, which is uh, more prone to errors than using a voice packet and using even one bit uh, uh, of the... No, you, you've got me wrong, actually. Um, I am talking about looking actually at the sync, sync word with correlation, so, which is... So the sync word plus this... Uh, no, no. No, not necessarily. I would actually just look at the um, the sync vector, because by definition, the sync vector is is has complete negative correlation with the stream. Um, when I when I gave you those new sync words, I was very careful about it. The sync word for the header is the exact opposite of a stream sync word, so there can certainly never be a confusion there, ever ever. So therefore it's a case that that would actually, the way I'm proposing is a very sensitive way of detecting end of stream. Yes, you can actually look at the contents of that header if you so need, but you don't need to necessarily. That The reason you have the contents of the header saying this is the end of the stream is in case the repeater accidentally picks up just the end frame, you know, because of interference, whatever. And you can look at it and go, oh, I've got a header. Is this the beginning of something? And you can look at it and go, oh, no, it's the end. And obviously, if it doesn't decode, that's no problems, because you'll be waiting for the rest of the data to come through anyway, the late entry. OK, so in theory, uh, we've got four different sync births. Yeah. And uh, they, all, they are all composed of minus and plus three symbols. Yeah. To get deviation as, as much as possible, yeah, as 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 deviant as possible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what if we 
naively uh, repeated the sync word for 40 milliseconds? That's a naive question, probably a stupid one. No, it's not a stupid question. That is actually similar to what T star does. Um, I, I was going to mention that, but I couldn't be bothered to type it in. I, an alternative way to do it, and this is exactly what D star does, and for, for all its faults, D star is not a bad protocol. Um, what it does do is it actually has a unique sync thing, which is actually much longer than the normal sync. The normal sync in D star is quite short, it's GMSK. Um, it does actually have a unique end marker of, I think it's 32 symbols. Very much GMSK, so it's just ones and noughts. It's not as complex as ours. And yes, yeah, it's, it's got a long um, sequence, which in theory will never appear in, a, in an audio stream. And certainly it does, it does seem to work pretty well, actually. So that is actually an option which I did consider and I didn't document because um, simply because the only way I access uh, Discord is via my mobile phone and I really can't be bothered to type that much in. <laughs> it's not ideal. I don't have it on my uh, laptop, for example. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'd be very happy with that because that would be a very, very explicit end of stream marker that, especially with correlation, could be both sensitive and unique. And that That's is great. exactly what we want. Sorry, I, I'm taking notes. <laughs> yes, I, I think we're in violent, disagree, uh, violent agreement, aren't we? I mean, I, I completely agree that having a, a sync word as a end of stream indicator is a, is a good way to do that. Um, because as Jonathan mentioned, it is a very clear indicator. And LSF, the, 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 uh, the header sync word is, is the perfect one to use there. Um, the, I, I think from part, part of the issue is like, I haven't experienced the, the, the problems that Jonathan has. Um, I very much use um, some heuristics in, in my code to determine whether or not uh, the end of stream bit can be trusted. Uh, and then also look for an immediate following um, sync word. So if there is a sync word, I don't, I defer the decision to drop um, it, until the sync word is missing, in other words. Um, and that I can tell you, seems I can tell to work you the, well. I can tell you the heuristics that I use, this is the heuristics are exactly based on what I did for the modes. Essentially, um, in order to get into an MMDVM, this is true of all modes, your sync has to be perfect. Okay, the idea is, you know, it's uh, got hysteresis. So you've got to be really good to get in. However, once you're into the system, it drops those requirements slightly and it allows a certain amount of errors on your um, synchronization because that's what life's like. You do, you know, miss bits for whatever reason. And, and it will, providing your sinks are above a certain threshold of goodness, which is not perfect, you will stay in the system. If you drop below that, I think it gives you a leeway of, I think, three more sinks before it declares you gone. And it sends a message to the, uh, the host saying this transmission has gone and you go back to square one, waiting for somebody to come back in, however, which way. Uh, so that's how I do it. I think it's, I think it's three sinks I'm allowed to lose, which is 120 milliseconds. Maybe I should make it a bit longer. I don't know. Um, but that's how I do it. And of course, when you go back to zero, then you have to have a perfect sink again to get back into the system uh, so that it doesn't trigger and spend time trying to decode stuff that's mostly rubbish, but allows for the fact that once you're in the system, you may be less than perfect. And I have found that on other modes to be a, a pretty good way of doing things um, because you, you can't guarantee things are good all the time, mobile, flutter, or whatever. Gotcha. Um... Yeah, I, I think the issue, uh, you know, one, one of the reasons that it, uh, the idea of using a, a link setup frame was problematic for me is it would, it would affect the um, state machine that I currently have, which does expect, you know, a link setup frame to be, pre to, to precede some other information, right? Um, and the other, the other thing is that as um, Wojciech mentioned, um, because of that, I would need to decode the frame to know what's going to follow, right? The, the assumption is the, there is following data. Um, and so if we, 
I, I think we need to come up with, at, at this point, we are, we're in agreement about what needs to happen. We just need to work out the details, right? Uh, on on how do we how do we end the end the sequence uh, using a sync word and some other information. Now, if we just did a, I I, I actually like the suggestion of doing a full frame of uh, header syncs. That's um, easy to detect. It is. Um, yes, I can see that. What I would probably suggest would be the sync frames I did, I think were based on, is it gold codes? Barker I can't remember. Codes. I can't, yeah, I, I did say what it was at the time. But the thing is, though, they come in various lengths. And I was thinking that if we're going to go that way, it might be an idea that instead of just repeating the header sync over and over again, which could be problematic, I think, if somebody was just decoding that on its own because they would get a bit confused. It'd be better if we actually had something entirely left field as a sync word, maybe one of these, a longer version of what we have now from the same family and use that so that it can never be interpreted as a header. You know, it has its own meaning as close to 40 milliseconds long as possible. Does that make sense? Something entirely different that say cannot be misinterpreted. What if we um, use the same sync word that I've been using? I've been I have proposed using for the bit error rate. Oh, so you mean the, the unused one? Yeah. I don't see why not. I mean, um, those essentially there's four. Yep. Which I created. The two we're using are opposites of each other. Yeah. On purpose. Uh, DMR does the same trick. Uh, System Fusion definitely does not. It's rubbish, that is. And the, um, oh, I could tell you some stories about system fusion. It's so weak. Um, and the other two are actually just bit reversals of the first ones. Yeah. But they are a negative correlation to each other. Same thing. Um, I've got no, no issues with that whatsoever. Um, I just want to see something stronger than using that bit. Gotcha. Having, a, having something that's say completely left field that has no other meaning within the protocol for example like you know a completely different sync bit sync sync pattern sorry that that to me fulfills everything i'd like to see because that's cannot be confused with anything excuse me um but yeah um using that one but you want to use that for bit error rate testing and i do i just wonder if there's a way to do both <laughs> maybe um hmm. I, I don't know but say we, we don't we don't have to be limited to that. At least in my implementation on the modem, I'm you know I can sniff all sorts of syn synchronizations. I'm not limited to that length, so I can actually have that running in parallel, and it'll look at it and go, okay, I'm checking these for uh, eight symbols, and I'm checking this one for thirty-two symbols. That's not a problem. Gotcha. Um, right now, my my code only looks at at eight symbols, so um, yeah, I'm, it would be a change there, hmm. but. Um, I, I assume at some point, if I want to support other modes, that will have to ha that would have well, to change. Well, you can still anyway. do the eight symbols because obviously there will be eight symbols at the beginning of this one, and in theory, if that matches, you can go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. and then you could go into branch into another bit of code, going, let's test the rest of it for the rest sure. of the symbols, and if it matches, then you go, oops, off, and if it doesn't match, we just say that's a load of corruption and do whatever you do. Right. Um, I think that's great. Do you? Um, in that case, do you want to propose a code? Yeah, I uh, obviously have to do some research. Um, Wikipedia is my friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, I think it, everyone's. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how long you want it to be. It doesn't need to be 40 milliseconds long, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm th thinking purely in terms of DV, because the idea is it's going to be fresh air. Your transmitter is going to go off. And so, therefore, it doesn't matter if it's not a full 40 milliseconds. Um, but you may think differently. Yeah, I think the, the main thing is that it's not um, uh, easily confused with uh, one of the additional sync words, right? I, I think that's mm. the that's the real the, the real challenge with only mm. eight bits uh, yeah. that we have, uh, and those codes that you proposed, I think, are are perfect. Um, uh, but we have eight of them, uh, mm. and, and it's it's I've looked at trying to squeeze other bits, you know, change them a little bit, but it's in it's it doesn't work very well. Well, the problem is if you change only one or two bits, it can be just be seen as corruption. Yes, yep, so absolutely. That's, that's one of the reasons I suggested after the original ones, which only had like one bit difference. And I thought, 
you know, in the no. real world, that, that can happen very, <laughs> very easily and you'll just get confused. So we had to, and say, I got the idea from DMR where they literally have negative correlation between the two, like we right. have. They can never, ever be misinterpreted. And, and it's really easy to tell, right? You know, you're, you're going to have either a very positive correlation or a very negative correlation yeah, on the same right. bloodstream. Yeah. yeah. In fact, you can use the same correlator for both, technically. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't. But, you know. Possible. Very good. So it sounds like we have some some actions going forward and and at least a broad agreement. Mm. Yeah, um, I need to find something suitable and then obviously we need to discuss this. Uh, I've already got a branch in my code that does this, the new, um, I call it EOF. Um, it's easy enough to change that to support it. Obviously, I need to change the modem firmware as well, uh, which is a bit of a pain, but so what? Yeah. Oh, very good. All right, what else? You want to talk about good error rates? Yeah, I do. I want to talk about uh, bit error rates, uh, having a little bit of bias in this particular direction um, to get some really good visibility uh, supported as early as possible and strictly not a, a protocol change, uh, at least not by my way of thinking. Um, so so tell, me, tell me where I can help and uh, to get really good visibility going for the future. We have a future path uh, coming up pretty quickly for silicon and the expectations are are going to be pretty high for ver for validation and verification. So anything that we can do now, um, and support from from development, uh, pretty pretty necessary for that to happen without a lot of cram and last minute pain and 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 work. Um, so so let me know what I need to know. Uh, well, Oh, my mic is still on there. Um, <laughs> uh, for me, because I've got so many different systems that I'm working with, um, having some interoperability between each of those uh, is uh, really helpful. Um, and so that's why I propose some interoperability and an interoperable standard uh, for bit error, bit error rate testing. Um, and it, it is just that, it's what I'm using and uh, it's a proposal. It's it's probably it's I'm sure not perfect. Um, it's it's working well for me, um, but I was hoping to get uh, you know feedback on uh, what works, what doesn't, uh, and and what's the right way forward because I don't have a lot of experience with with that. Um, I do know that you know uh, none of the test equipment that I have is going to you know, construct a, a uh, M17 frame for me and inject, uh, you know, pseudo randomized data into it. Um, it it'll generate pseudo randomized data, but I'm not going to be able to make sense of it because it's not in any frame format. So having a frame format, uh, and, and I chose a, a puncture uh, matrix that matches our, our uh, stream payload because that to me made the most sense. Um, it, it, there are other, we, we could, Certainly, try other puncture matrices, um, but I, you know I'm I'm looking for feedback on on those sort of and that aspect of of the proposal. Okay, yeah, definitely. In the path is um, uh, at least from from my point of view for for where remote labs can help is to develop um, the, exactly this sort of thing. So so fuzzing, uh, you know, and and uh, fairly yeah. rigorous testing. Um, that's that's in the roadmap. Um, so I, I perked up with with the with this work because uh, it's all yeah. helpful. And well, Jonathan's provided good feedback. I mean, the initial proposal had a header frame in there, uh, and that's certainly not needed. Uh, it's certainly not wanted for for bit error rate testing. Right. Um, but but something it, it, you know some standard is needed um, because we are going to have soon a lot of pieces of equipment uh, around. Uh, and it would be good to test against each other, or at least have some standard test suite that we can just point at a device and say, how well is this working? Yes. All right. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> about this. I'm, I personally don't see the need for doing so because I mean, once you've got a suitable, um, transmitter that's like a reference transmitter be it one of rob's or one of mine potentially a hotspot sitting in the corner it doesn't take too much effort to potentially 
record, now I've done this on different modes, record a load of audio maybe off the Friday night net and just replay it back through over and over again as a source of genuine M17 audio and then measure the BER against that because you know that that is authentic, if you know what I mean, with the correct puncturing, you know, it's real world data. Um, my stuff gives an awful lot of diagnostics about BER anyway. Uh, both a running BR and also the end BR. So from my point of view, once we have a working transmitter, we can potentially optimize receivers quite easily based on that. Um, so I personally would rather spend my time at the moment adding richness to the uh, client, for example, uh, like GPS data and things like that, which we've talked about and see if we can get that through. Yes. So I, yeah. I'm actually more interested in doing that rather than BER stuff, which I can right. say I can read out my logs anyway. Right. And I, I think that there is no conflict here whatsoever. So the the work that that um, that I'm interested in in doing in order to to move to silicon, you know, which is really not very far from the work that you already have in your code base. Honestly, it's not that not that far. Um, these things are not not in conflict and do not prevent each other from happening in any way. So I say go for it. Uh, please proceed. And um, I think that that. Um, We'll be able to do like the some of the some of the protocol fuzzing and some of the val validation and verification very soon. Um, if there is anything that we find, and the goal is to not find anything by doing these tests, the goal is to confirm that the, the all these choices that we've made and talked about over 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 time uh, have been good ones, and, and the, you see evidence of the solid engineering. Um, so that's the goal, and, and as a uh, raging optimist, my expectation, um, you know. But the the testing, the sorts of sorts of testing, protocol testing, and injection, and things like that. If it does reveal something, well, then good. Then we'll know uh, we'll know what to improve. And those two things are 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 not they do not get in each other's way. Um, so please please proceed with the things that that uh, you're motivated and inspired to do, and. Um, I'll I'll probably be talking to Rob a little bit more about this to try to see if I can help out and if we can formalize some of this and develop the the thing that would be really awesome and that would be a test suite that you can point uh, radios and implementations to. So I think we can have both things. All right. Anyone else? I think we've covered it. Was there anything else that you wanted to dis discuss? Um, I think we actually, we covered the two items that you wanted to, to cover. Um, yeah. yeah, any oh. other, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Um, while we're all here. So yesterday, uh, Wojciech and I were working on changing the puncturing of the links, to, uh, the, uh, the header. Um, Jonathan, did, did you follow along with that at all? Any comments on that? Um, I've only just come back. I was at my girlfriend's until a few hours ago, so oh, I did. I, I did say I didn't. Oh, very, very nice. Thank you. But I did say I wasn't around until Sunday afternoon, so I, I just haven't followed it up. I'd like to know what the rationale is. I've got no issue with it. I'd just like to know what the rationale is for changing it. So, I think the rationale um, was at the time that if you looked at the puncture matrix, there were a lot of uh, it was not evenly punctured. So there were places where uh, there was a lot of puncturing in the in the bit stream, and then there were places where there was none, right? So there were six runs of six bits that were not punctured, and and two bits followed by a puncture, two bits followed by a puncture, and that seemed like it would be problematic that you would have uh, the potential for um, bit errors occurring in certain spots affecting the bit stream more than others. Well, I mean, I'm happy to go along with my stuff, obviously, with whatever's decided on that, because I've got no no opinions on the subject. So I, I can see where you're coming from in, you know, evening it out. Any idea why it was like that in the first place? <laughs> well, it, it was my, my idea, my old puncturing pattern. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go along with it. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's just, a, a, uh, just a, an array of trues and falses in my stuff, so it's no big deal. So if I if I may, I think the the new puncturing pattern uh, it's the P1 because we've got a different puncturing pattern for the LSF and for the voice frames. 
So for voice frames, it's an easy task because we only um, eradicate one bit per 12 bits of input. So that's easy and that's already uh, optimal. And for the P1 uh, pattern, uh, there is uh, an uneven number of bits coming in and we have to uh, puncture out some of them and end up with 46, I believe. So uh, taking an input, input of 61, we have to uh, select or pick 46. If I'm, if I'm correct, I can check it right now. Uh, so the idea was to, um, uh, to propose uh, uh, a partial uh, um, puncturing pattern that would take 122 bits and output uh, 96. I don't remember. So uh, uh, the thing to, uh, to notice was that uh, if we took one bit out and then uh, the rest of the bits, we could use just uh, a two thirds or a two thirds puncturer. And that's an optimal one to use for the rest. And we are effectively doing uh, the two thirds puncturing scheme. I, I believe Rob can, uh, can explain this further. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much more needs to be explained. It was just uh, the closest we could get uh, with the uh, odd number of bits that we had to, a, to an even uh, two thirds puncture matrix. Um, it seems to work, it, it seems to work fine. My, my only concern is we now have some interoperable um, systems, right? And so this is a back where, this is a breaking change. Um, you know, do, do we want to have some sort of a flag day where uh, we decide to make this change, or do we just go for it today? And uh, any excuse for a party? I mean, generally speaking, <laughs> I don't think there are many people, for example, running MMDVMs against your TNCs. It's since be MMDVM to MMDVM, and probably no, TNC. but they are using the C plus plus code uh, with RTL SDRs. Yes, but uh, the number of people we're talking about is still relatively low. So oh, yeah. I would suggest at this moment in time is a time like the end of end of message. This is the time to do it. No, no later. I mean, there may be a, a period of time when, for example, my stuff won't talk to your stuff, but it probably won't be for very long, to be perfectly honest, depending yeah. on when you get your firmware out. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I could probably, if I can see the puncture matrix in a term way that I understand it, I'll, I could do it tonight. So it's uh, a there's... question of the the probability, the uniform. It went back. It went to a uniform distribution from something that was not quite uniform. That was. That's the... correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think you know. By the time this stuff sort of filters through, because people know that my my code updates on a daily basis. It's famous for that. So anybody who's on the bleed, and bear in mind, uh, M17's in my beta version. It's not in the full released version still. And right. so people following that will be building their own software and will be updating regularly. So, you know, and as soon as I announce it on OpenDV saying, look, if you're doing this, grab the latest, uh, but make sure you update everything to the latest. Um, people will do that because you say it's not in, it won't, it's not in Pystar, for example, for that reason, because it's not in the mainstream on purpose until it's got to a certain level of um, maturity. Gotcha. Okay, good. Very good. All right, any closing closing comments, last questions, or uh, anything that you, that you need in terms of resources, or are there any uh, challenges that I can help with? Um, I just want to say thank you for, for hosting this, and it was great to meet everyone here. Well, you're very welcome. My pleasure. Well, I don't think I need any. I'm on, I'm on, my microphone's on, that's good. Uh, I don't think I need anything else. Um, <laughs> I'm getting confused on this. I think I've got just about everything. I've got a few modems lying about, a few hotspots, PCs, radios, uh, modems that don't work properly yet. <clears> yes, <throat> the usual. <laughs> well, no, it's because I've actually got to write code for them, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some assembly required. Oh God, it's I2C <laughs> on an M7 is not funny because they don't make it easy anymore. Um, yeah. hmm? so, really? Yeah, because you know the low-level drivers and all that? It's yeah. all been taken away. You've got to use HAL now. 
Oh, that's, on M7s. Yeah, I use is, Hal anyway. So I don't, or I, I, well, no, I didn't actually write the STM32 support anyway for the MMDVM originally, and it wasn't written with Hal. So gotcha. I've got the problem of potentially moving. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I, I, I've got. Okay, I can play at that. Hang on, stick. I'll grab the MMDVM. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is one I, I don't support because you'll see that um, this is the latest repeater builder beta. There is an I2C display. Oh, cool. The idea is instead of having lots of LEDs along, which is quite common, is uh, the idea is to have that little display saying M17 or DMR or whatever. All right. And can okay. I can I get it to work? Nah. <laughs> Not yet. Lovely modem works brilliantly, but. That bit doesn't, and I can't get it to work. But uh, yeah, I'd like to go to HAL, but it also means redeveloping everything else. That's the only problem. And that's a bit of a scary thought, but it probably has to be done at some stage. Yeah. Very good. All right, let's close here. And right. we will uh, we'll do this again. Uh, as Just let me know if it's needed. Um, or, or not if, but but when. Uh, when you're ready to, to bring these any of this uh, back up for discussion. And uh, see you on uh, Discord. Well, I will, I will say that weekends work a heck of a lot better for me. I know there's the Friday net, and I'm at work at that time, and it's just impossible for me to join in. Okay. Yeah, this but, this time time slot works good for me, um, you know, so until yeah. next time. It started at 6 o'clock in the evening for me on a Sunday. That's no big deal. The only news is I'm not around every other week, uh, every right. other Sunday, so as long, long as it fits on one of my Sundays. when I've, well, at least my girlfriend works Sundays, that's why. Ah, yes, She's understand. working yesterday, so... Um, so that's why I'm oh, around. Very good. All right. And also, well, it also means right, I'm not, not necessarily around Fridays, but I am next Friday as well for the net. So oh, good. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. <clears throat> Looks All like right. uh, Matthias is uh, getting some progress on the uh, hotspot side of it. So I want to get, get back into that. Yeah, I found a I found a hell of a bug in there. My mistake for putting packet mode in, which I uh, took out and found out that packet mode was matching with the stream sync, not the packet sync. Mm -hmm. So that anything stream came out as packet, which is no longer handled. It wasn't handled yeah. properly anyway. So that was easy to yeah, fix. Yeah, I got but... that. Uh, I got oh, that firmware running on, on the uh, hotspot right now. So yeah, I think we just need to get that you know receive side kind yeah. of uh, yeah. worked out. And that's a black art to me. I'm, I, you know, I don't know anything about that. That's Andy CA6JAU, and he did actually look at it and change it, but obviously it's not quite right. We need him to get on M17, basically. That's the bottom line, isn't it? It'd be awesome to have him. Yeah. 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 Right. Bye, guys. I do have to run. All right. Okay. okay. See you soon, yeah. Rob. Bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Adios. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll close here, and I'll see you on Discord. Write me if you need yeah. anything. Yeah. Okie dokie. See you then. See you, folks. Bye. See you, guys. Bye.